We live our life every day. We live with a Newtonian picture of space and time. It's something that we are comfortable with. But Einstein was able to make reason conquer sense. And that really was the genius of Einstein. This notion that space and time are unity, to me, is one of the greatest insights that has ever occurred in science. It's so counterintuitive to everything we've ever experienced as human beings. And in the hands of Albert Einstein, this new picture of space would solve a deep mystery having to do with the most familiar force in the cosmos. Gravity. Newton knew that gravity is a force that attracts objects to each other. And his laws predicted the strength of this force with fantastic precision. But how does gravity actually work? How does the Earth pull on the moon across hundreds of thousands of miles of empty space? They behave as if they're connected by some kind of invisible rope. But everyone knew that wasn't true. And Newton's laws provided no explanation. Einstein found that no band-aid patches would fix Newtonian gravity. He had to invent a mechanism for it. He had to understand it. After puzzling over this problem for more than 10 years, Einstein reached a startling conclusion. The secret to gravity lay in the nature of space-time. It was even more flexible than he had previously realized. It could stretch like an actual fabric. This was a truly radical break from Newton. Think of this table as space-time and think of these balls as objects in space. Now, if space-time were nice and flat, like the surface of this table, objects would travel in straight lines. But if space is like a fabric that can stretch and bend, well, this may seem a little strange. But watch what happens if I put something heavy on a stretchy space-time fabric. Now, if I take my shot again, the ball travels along an indentation in the fabric that the heavier object creates. And this, Einstein realized, is how gravity actually works. It's the warping of space-time caused by the objects within it. In other words, gravity is the shape of space-time itself. The moon is kept in orbit not because it's pulled to the Earth by some mysterious force, but rather because it rolls along a curve in the space-time fabric that the Earth creates. With Einstein, space became not only real, but flexible. So suddenly space had properties, suddenly space had curvature, suddenly space had a flexible kind of geometry, almost like a rubber sheet. It opens up a whole new way of thinking about reality that describes the entire universe. Einstein becomes Einstein because of that observation. Where Newton saw space as passive, Einstein saw it as dynamic. It's interwoven with time and it dictates how things move. So, after Einstein, space can no longer be thought of as a static stage. It's an actor and it plays a leading role in the cosmic drama. Now, it's one thing to think of space as dynamic, active and flexible, like a fabric. But is it really? Is this just a metaphor, or does it actually describe what space is? Well, Einstein's theory predicts that one way to find out would be to take a little journey to the edge of a black hole. Black holes are collapsed stars, massive objects crushed to a fraction of their original size. Gravity around them is so strong that according to Einstein's math, a spinning black hole can literally drag space along with it, twisting it like an actual piece of cloth. The nearest black hole is trillions of miles away, 
making it a challenge to test this prediction. But in the late 1950s, a physicist named Leonard Schiff began searching for a way to test Einstein's ideas about space much closer to home. Schiff was inspired by something we usually think of as a child's toy, a gyroscope. He thought that if space really twists, like a fabric, a gyroscope might allow him to detect it. It was a strange idea, and he chose a strange place to share it with the world. The faculty swimming pool at Stanford. Here, in 1959, Schiff met with two colleagues, William Fairbank and Bob Cannon. He was excited about an ad he'd seen for a high-tech gyroscope. Though it looked different, it basically worked the same as the child's toy. Then and there, the three decided to launch a device like this into orbit around the Earth. Normally, a gyroscope's axis points in a fixed direction. But if Earth is actually dragging space, then the gyroscope's axis would be dragged along with it, shifting its orientation in a way that could be measured. It was a brilliantly simple plan. There was just one problem. Einstein's theories predict that the Earth's rotation twists space by only a tiny amount. An amount so small, it would be like trying to measure the height of a penny from 62 miles away. The team spent more than two years trying to figure out how to make such a precise measurement. They finally devised a plan to attach four freely floating gyroscopes to a telescope aimed at a distant star. If space twists, then over time the gyroscopes would no longer point at the star since they'd get caught up in the swirl of space. And in 1962, they applied to NASA for a grant, requesting around a million dollars for what would come to be called Gravity Probe B. Members of the team originally thought the project would take about three years. They were just a little optimistic. With an ever-growing team, Gravity Probe B became one of the longest-running experiments in history. Decade after decade was spent trying to realize the original vision, which meant launching a telescope into space and building gyroscopes that were among the smoothest objects ever created. The technology is just frightening. It was like the carrot on the front of the mule. It was like it was always five to 10 years away when we could do this. And it was five to 10 years away for about 35 years. Consuming more than four decades and $750 million, the project was nearly canceled by NASA nine times. Ten, nine, Finally, eight, in April of 2004, the team gathered to witness the launch. Of the three men who sat by the pool back in 1959, only one was alive to see it. And there we were, watching. <laughs> it's a terribly exciting moment in your life. Just a thrilling experience. It was flawless. 10,000 things did not go wrong. <laughs> For over a year, Gravity Probe B orbited the Earth while the team nervously monitored its every move, trying to see if the Earth would actually twist space. Finally, the data began to trickle in, and there was a problem. The gyroscopes were experiencing a tiny, unexpected wobble, and to clean up the data would cost millions. With funds running out, it looked like nearly half a century of work was about to go down the drain. Then at almost the last possible moment, two sources of additional funding emerged. The son of original team leader William Fairbank, who made a private donation, and Turkey Al Saad, a member of the Saudi royal family with a degree in aeronautics from Stanford, who arranged for a large grant. Over the next two years, the problem with the data was solved. 
revealing that the axes of the gyroscope shifted by almost exactly the amount predicted by Einstein's equations. I think it's the first time that you can actually see Einstein's effect, his drift, with the naked eye. This experiment provides the most direct evidence ever found that space is something real, a physical entity like a fabric. After all, if space were nothing, there would be nothing to twist. But at the same time that Albert Einstein was investigating space on the largest of scales, another band of physicists was probing the universe on extremely tiny scales. And there they found a completely uncharted realm where Einstein's picture of space, it was nowhere to be found. Do you see what I'm talking about? Imagine you could shrink billions of times smaller than your current size. This is the realm of atoms and subatomic particles, the fundamental building blocks of everything we can see. And when you get down to this side, the world plays by a wildly different set of rules called quantum mechanics. According to these rules, even if you try to remove every last atom and particle, you'd find that empty space is still far from empty. In fact, it's teeming with activity. Particles are constantly popping in and out of existence. They erupt out of nothingness, quickly annihilate each other and disappear. In quantum mechanics, empty space is not that empty. It's full of fluctuating fields, full of all sorts of uh, jittery things going on. It's a place where particles are constantly fluctuating and annihilating each other and being created again and annihilating. It's a place of chaos and bubbling. While the theory predicted this, it wasn't until 1948 that a scientist named Hendrik Casimir suggested that even though we can't see these particles, they should cause empty space to do something we can see. And he predicted that if you take two ordinary metal plates and place them extremely close together, say, closer together than the thickness of a sheet of paper, then particles with certain energies would be excluded because in some sense, they wouldn't fit between the plates. With more of this frenetic activity outside the plates than inside, Casimir thought the plates would be pushed together by what we usually think of as empty space. And some years later, when the experiment was done, Casimir was proven right. In empty space, the plates were pushed together. So on atomic scales, empty space is not empty. It's so flooded with activity that it can force objects to move.